Hello and welcome to LIS 571. Our topic for today is networks. Uh, this will be a perhaps not so short um, uh, and yet oversimplified lecture on the technology behind networks. Uh, and our purpose today is to distinguish mostly between the idea of the local area network or the LAN and networks of networks such as the internet. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, we could build a semester-long course around either topic and still barely scratch the surface. So um, this is a really kind of a high-level overview. Um, we'll look at some key concepts and some important terminology that you really need to know. Uh, and this lecture supplements and reinforces what you'll read about in the text uh, and other readings and videos I've assigned. Uh, and hopefully between this lecture and the other resources, uh, you'll come to understand it. Uh, so we want to talk about the fundamentals of communication on local area networks, including Ethernet and name resolution on local area networks, and the fundamentals of communication on the Internet, including TCP IP and name resolution on the Internet. Uh, and there are other kinds of local area networks besides Ethernet, and there are other global connected networks besides the internet. Uh, we'll stick to those uh, and the principles will apply to others. Uh, if this is the first time you're hearing about this, um, as, as oversimplified as this is, um, it may still be confusing. There is a lot of terminology, um, words that you may not have heard before. Um, I think if you think about the concepts, uh, try to think about metaphors, try to relate this to things that you already know about, uh, such as the telephone, think about telephone numbers, think about directories, uh, whatever you can do. I'm mostly really concerned about uh, conceptually understanding networks, uh, and a lot of that is going to come from uh, really diving into the term. So I encourage you, uh, where terminology is a problem to uh, look up these terms on the internet, uh, on the web, uh, you know, try to come to an understanding of the terms, don't let the terminology uh, be your stumbling block. So with that, let's uh, move on to the lecture. Uh, and to start out with, uh, it may be useful to think of um, uh, the plain old uh, telephone service as a metaphor for digital networks. Uh, I think you probably all have an image in mind, the old-time uh, telephone network switchboard. Uh, and, um, uh, of course, maybe that, that predates um, uh, most of you. I think this, this almost predates me. Uh, but the old-time telephone switchboard from the, the old-time movies. Um, so even if you don't have a personal recollection, um, you might recall movies where the the telephone uh, operators would be plugging wires into rows of jacks. And what they were doing was actually creating a physical connection between the caller and the recipient. So uh, this early network actually is referred to as POTS, or plain old telephone system. Uh, now, in most parts of the world, the, um, uh, uh, the, the old uh, mechanical switches uh, have been replaced by electronic switches. Um, most of the traffic today uh, is it's digital. Not everywhere. There are still some places where it's, it's mechanical like this. Uh, but from the standpoint of the average user, it still looks pretty much the same. Uh, if you had one of these old-style telephones, you could plug it in and it would still work. Uh, you would look up the name in some kind of a directory, identify the telephone number associated with the name, uh, and um, uh, somehow or other, um, a temporary continuous copper wire circuit uh, or something that looks uh, reasonably like it uh, would connect you to your recipient. Uh, it would persist as long as you're both talking, uh, and then when someone hangs up, uh, the circuit is broken uh, and uh, released for use by other parties. Uh, it's pretty rare now, uh, but it can happen. You know, maybe you've heard the, the message, I'm sorry, all circuits are busy now. Please hang up and try again later. Uh, and that means there aren't any unused wire segments, um, you know, perhaps wireless segments uh, that could be used to connect you and your party. Um, so a regular telephone, uh, landline telephone, uh, is connected uh, to a circuit uh, that's brought into your house. It's identified uh, by a unique set of numbers. Uh, if you're just crawling, uh, if, 
If you're just calling across town, uh, entering, uh, I don't know, maybe you remember the term dialing, uh, just the local number uh, into your telephone works fine. Uh, if you need to call a number in the next region uh, or state, then you need to include an area code. Uh, if you're calling another country, you need to include a country code. Uh, you know, the device needs to know uh, how to look outside its own range of local connections. Uh, so the connection in your house is uniquely identified from all of the other connections in the world by virtue of a country code, an area code, uh, and a local exchange number. Uh, so although current telephone networks take advantage of digital technologies, the telephone uh, the technology that connects your phone to a telephone network is still basically analog. Uh, as I say, telephones that were made a half a century ago still work. Uh, and there's some pretty clever engineering that um, is required in order to allow digital services like DSL to work over the local loop. So, uh, you know, if you think about this analogy, uh, then it might help you to understand uh, the digital networks that we're going to talk about in the rest of the lecture, the mm -hmm. local area network. Uh, and then the uh, network of networks and the idea that um, uh, we need to have different kinds of information uh, to move from the local area network to networks outside of the local area network and the idea of these numbers, various kinds of numbers that are needed to identify uh, networks that um, are local and networks that uh, are outside of your local, uh, local range. So, over the last few decades, um, uh, now to separate voice from data, uh, a number of approaches to creating efficient and effective data networks have been tried. Data is fundamentally different from voice. Um, so, in some respects, um, the digital networks aren't that different from the telephone network. Um, uh, a lot of various uh, computer devices out there with um, uh, unique numbers and names uh, electronic switches and other network devices pick apart the names and numbers, uh, create electrical connections, and transfer information. Uh, the fundamental difference, I think, between digital data networks and the traditional telephone networks uh, is that uh, sending a long stream of data, um, you know, as you might attempt over a telephone network using a persistent circuit, um, is, is problematic. Um, so how do you know all of it arrived? Did it arrive intact? Um, did it get to the right place? Um, so data transfers uh, are accomplished by breaking the information up into chunks of data uh, called packets or, or frames. And there's, there's probably a technical difference. I'm, I'm not going to make too much of a distinction. Um, the packets are packaged into frames that include information about the packet and intended recipient. Uh, they're sent separately, um, and the information is reassembled at the receiving end. Uh, and this process is called packet switching. Uh, so in simple terms, the process works in the following way on a local area network. Um, so when a software application gets ready to send some information over the network, uh, it hands the information off to a process that breaks the information up into smaller pieces of data. Uh, and to that to that piece of data, uh, some code is added to the front and back of each piece of data. It says what the packet is, what order the information is in, uh, who's supposed to get it. Uh, the process then transfers the packet off to uh, some kind of physical interface device that sends it out over the network. And the intended recipients find out about uh, the frames that are addressed to them. Basically, they just listen to every piece of traffic that goes by. Uh, the recipient has a similar physical interface device that um, uh, first assures that um, it is, in fact, the intended receiver. Uh, the recipient's interface uh, sends the packet on up to a process that looks at the packet to find out what's in it, uh, what order it's supposed to be in, uh, checks some special numbers in the packet designed to detect whether the, the data in the packet is exactly as sent or whether it's corrupt. Uh, it may have a, a flag similar to a, a post office return receipt requested. Uh, if so, the process sends a message back down to the physical device to let the sending device know that the packet was received. If the packet was corrupt, it might um, uh, send a, a message, please resend, um, and so on. And as the um, uh, recipient uh, collects all the packets, 
uh, a process strips off all the addressing information, um, puts it all together again, passes it on to the um, uh, intended software recipient um, uh, application at the recipient's end. So that's basically um, uh, packet switch, packet switching uh, in a nutshell. Uh, the um, uh, illustration up here is uh, an Ethernet type two frame. Uh, you can see uh, in kind of simplified form, uh, here we have the, um, uh, and I'll talk about these MAC addresses in the next slide, um, the destination address, the source address, uh, the Ethernet type, here would be your data here. Uh, the CRC checksum is a way of uh, uh, determining whether or not all of the rest of the information was accurately received. Uh, and so that's a data packet uh, that gets sent down the line. So um, the processes that determine how the data are broken up, tagged, and moved on to the next step, these are called protocols. Uh, so when you hear the term protocol, that's really just in simple terms. Um, a protocol is a method used to do something uh, and the formats that uh, have to be followed uh, in order to get it done. Uh, Ethernet um, uh, is the name of a process used originally to uh, connect um, what at the time were personal computers together. Uh, now when you buy an Ethernet card or, or if you buy a computer that has one built in, uh, one of the things that it comes with uh, is a fixed unchangeable number um, that's burned into its circuitry that is globally unique. And when I say globally unique, uh, I mean that no other Ethernet card in the world would have that same number. Uh, and the number is a long number. It's 48 bits long, uh, 2 to the 48th power. Uh, and um, uh, that means that there are uh, in the trillions of, of potential combinations. Um, and there shouldn't be any two uh, Ethernet cards with the same number. I, I suppose it's possible that a duplicate could happen, but um, if they follow the manufacturing rules, that, uh, that shouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, that number is called the MAC address. That stands for Media Access Control. Uh, don't confuse that with Macintosh computers. Um, uh, Mac computers also have MAC addresses, and PCs and Macs both have MAC addresses, so uh, uh, Media Access Control number. Anyway, so they've got this number, um, and so that's how computers on a local area network uh, know how to find each other because every computer has a different number. Uh, and so the sending um, uh, computer uh, sends its MAC address down the line uh, looking for um, the address of another computer. Uh, there are some internal uh, uh, processes going on on a LAN so that um, all of the computers on a LAN uh, trade their MAC addresses back and forth. Uh, and as I say, the, the um, uh, computers all listen to the traffic, and it's just by kind of gentleman's agreement uh, that um, uh, they, they uh, will only uh, read or open uh, mail that's addressed uh, specifically to them now. Uh, there, are, there are some ways that hackers will uh, not abide by that gentleman's agreement, and so that's how traffic uh, can get sniffed, uh, as they call it, on a LAN. Uh, and um, uh, so that's a topic for another day. Uh, anyway, uh, so pa traffic is constantly going up and down the, the wires on a local area network. Uh, occasionally they will collide. Uh, and uh, I'll save a, a kind of a complicated description of, of uh, a carrier sense uh, a collision detection and avoidance. There are some uh, complicated uh, electronics that go on uh, to detect and so on. Uh, but this, this places some, some physical limitations on lands in terms of the, the length of, of cables that can comprise a LAN. It turns out to be about 100 meters or so. Uh, and uh, so beyond that, you start needing some additional electronic devices. These are known as switches, bridges, and um, routers. Uh, and, um, and so those can, can extend the, the length of, of a land beyond 100 meters. Uh, some more uh, details on, on the uh, MAC addresses. These can be used to control security. 
Uh, for example, if you were to bring your own uh, computer to the University of Arizona, a laptop or so on, uh, you need to register the computer's MAC address before you can get some services on some of the uh, local area nodes. Uh, similarly, you can lock down um, uh, your own home router uh, by restricting access according to the MAC address. Some, some, home, router, some home routers um, uh, will enforce security uh, according to the MAC address. So, uh, a few tidbits of information on the MAC addresses for local area networks. So, name resolution on the LAN. Uh, some of you have given uh, your computer's names when you plug them into your local area network. Um, there, there are some confusing issues. Um, part of this has to do with, with Microsoft uh, initially trying to, to go it on their own um, TCP IP, uh, which I will talk about starting on the, the next slide. Um, uh, was a long-established way of doing addressing on networks. Uh, and as I say, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Microsoft initially resisted this uh, and came up with their own way of handling name resolution and addressing on local area networks. Uh, and so you may read or hear about things like NetBIOS, uh, which was originally called NetBuoy, uh, there are different ways that Microsoft uses on Microsoft networks uh, to uh, deal with Windows shares. Uh, there is a Windows Internet naming service. Uh, and um, uh, Microsoft finally came around um, and does handle TCP IP on their networks. But there are still some remnants of these old naming conventions. So I mentioned this in passing. Um, if you have Microsoft computers uh, on a LAN, uh, they still have these NetBIOS names, uh, and uh, you will see these. Uh, and uh, so just be aware of this. Uh, I'm not going to test you on it, but um, in, in, in the interest of completeness, uh, I have to mention that there is still some remnant Microsoft addressing on Microsoft networks. Um, but, um, so we've, we've now talked about how computers find each other on a local area network using uh, Ethernet and MAC addresses. Um, they're kind of like telephone numbers, I guess that's, a, uh, that's an easy way to think about it. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, local, local telephone numbers at any rate. But uh, now we need to talk about what happens if you want to dial long distance. Uh, and so we need something to connect numbers to other networks, uh, and that's what the Internet is, uh, which is a network of networks, and TCP IP is what makes it possible for computers with disparate architectures that are not part of the local area network to find and exchange data. So TCP IP was invented uh, primarily by Vinton Cerf and Robert Kahn in about 1973 as part of the ARPA. Uh, that stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency, and that became DARPA, the Defense uh, Department of Defense ARPANET Research Project, and ARPANET uh, eventually morphed into uh, today's Internet. Um, uh, the IP, or Internet Protocol Address, uh, is what uniquely identifies a resource on the Internet. Uh, the IP address is a 32-bit number, um, and that means that there's capacity for about 4 billion unique addresses. Um, visually represented as usually as decimal numbers um, separated by periods, uh, four 8-bit um, decimal numbers. I, I'm sure you've, you know what I'm talking about, these, these IP addresses over here, such as uh, 192.168.1.1. Um, and this is referred to as a dotted quad um, or dotted decimal notation. And this system of addressing is also known as IP version 4, uh, IP uh, v4. Uh, now the bad news is we have um, in the past few years run out of 32-bit addresses. Um, there is a replacement, um, IPv6, uh, which has lots and lots of addresses. Um, 
but in fact, we're still living in an IPv4 world. So um, it's still worth talking about. And I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of technical detail. Um, this is going to look a little bit complicated, but um, uh, even if you don't fully get all the details, I, I really want you to try to get at least the concept of what's going on here. So um, IP addresses are broken into two parts, the network portion and the host portion. The network portion, which is the left side of the IP address, uh, uniquely identifies the network. And by the network, I mean the internet part of the network. That is the Arizona.edu or the Google.com part of the network. And that's the network to which the device belongs. And the host portion, which is the right part of the IP address, uh, uniquely identifies this particular device uh, within the specific network. So if you want to go back to our telephone analogy, think area code and um, local phone number. Uh, so the network portion is like the area code on the left side and the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the local number is the host portion on the right. So. Uh, it's possible that two people might have the same local number, say 555-1212, but not in the same area code. Uh, so you could have the same phone number, but then you'd have a different area code, right? So, uh, and then let's talk about the idea that there might be large networks with thousands of devices and small networks with only a few. So originally the range of addresses was broken into um, three classes of networks to accommodate networks of different sizes. So um, class A networks uh, reserved for the largest organizations were assigned a network number between one and 26 for the first octet. So uh, here we've got um, a class A address was for the biggest networks uh, so that was a 1 for the, um, uh, for the network portion to 126 for the network portion. And then the uh, uh, clients here were uh, anywhere from, you know, XXX to XXX. So that's what the class A addresses look like. Uh, and then um, the remainder of the numbers were left to the owner to identify the hosts, which are the individual computers or other resources within the... Um, uh, within the network. Um, so for example, uh, 48 was given or assigned to Prudential Securities. Uh, and um, uh, so anything starting with 48 was Prudential Securities and then they, they could assign um, uh, whatever they wanted uh, for the hosts. And then of course that meant that there could only be 126 large networks, um, but each of them could have you know, a large number of hosts. Um, similarly, Class B networks were uniquely identified by the first two octets. So anything from 128.1 to 191.254 were Class B. And then Class C networks were for even smaller networks. Um, and they would start 192.0.1 uh, to 223.255.254. And then so Class C networks... Um, uh, you would only have from 0 to 254, um, and so you'd only have 255 hosts. Um, now, uh, you may have noticed some holes in these um, certain blocks of IP addresses were and still are reserved for special purposes. Um, anything with 127.x.x.x is used as a uh, it's called a loopback address, um, and it's called loopback because it loops back to your own computer. Sounds odd, but it's kind of handy for some kinds of programming and database uses. Um, uh, the blocks 192.168 um, and um, 10.x, those are, are reserved for private networks. Uh, and those are things like your local home network. Um, if you've ever set one up, you might have noticed um, if you've ever gotten your hands a little bit dirty with, with home networks that uh, you, the individual computers on your home network uh, have IP addresses that look something like that. Um, private networks use what is called network address translation. Uh, that's a method of sharing. You get a single IP address from uh, your internet service provider, uh, and then network address translation allows you um, to give the individual computers on your home network um, 
the ability to share that single IP address from your ISP through use of uh, your router is what's called a gateway. Anyway, so what's the point? Um, if your device knows its own network a class, uh, class A, B, or C, uh, and its own IP address, and the IP address of a recipient, it can tell whether the recipient of um, a message is a local computer on the LAN, or whether it's a foreign address that it will need to be forwarded, uh, and the way that it gets forwarded is with the help of a router or gateway connected to the internet. And it knows this by way of what's called a subnet mask, and the subnet mask looks like an IP address uh, in that it's also a dotted quad, uh, but the numbers in the subnet mask are assigned uh, to splice off the network and host portions of an IP address. Uh, the protocol that does this along with a few other tricks is the IP protocol. Uh, IP looks at your IP address, the IP address of the recipient, and the subnet mask to determine whether the recipient address is part of the local network or is found outside of it. So this is the part that gets a little bit mathy, but it's kind of cool. I'm going to show it to you, and like I say, I'm not going to test you on it, but at least in principle, I want you to see how this works. So here's my math slide. If you really want to understand um, you've got to do the math, uh, and um, uh, as I say, the, the dotted quad is represented as a decimal number like 192.168 because that's easy for us to look at it, but remember that in a computer um, it's all ones and zeros. So um, the subnet mask is a number that when anded, in like the, the, the logical process and, um, uh, so when, when we and the IP address um, with the subnet mask, uh, we pop out and we know we know this we know the the the, the class of the um, IP address. It it pops out the network portion and the client portion. So if, if we look at this, we can see how this works. So we we know that this is a class C network. Um, because of our IP address 255.255.255.0. So this is a class C address. And here we have the full network address. That's the IP address of our, the computer we're, we're looking at. And remember how AND works. 0 and 0 is 0. 1 and 0 is 1. 0 and 0 is 0. So. Um, knowing that this is a class C address, so this is going to be the network portion and this is going to be the, the host portion. Uh, we can pop out the network portion over here. That's this portion here, and this is the network portion, and this is the client portion. This is the client portion. And so a gateway would recognize external addresses and an address that, that is outside the range um, of this particular um, uh, uh, IP address. Uh, for example, if we were to send this to 192.168.6.10, uh, it would recognize that this doesn't belong to this local uh, area network, and the gateway would uh, forward this uh, to an external router uh, for routing outside the local area network. Uh, so, uh, this uh, particular Class C network has a potential range of 255 possible clients. Uh, anything else is located outside the local network uh, and um, uh, would be forwarded to an external router. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would look at the uh, MAC address on the Ethernet card and it would go to a computer that was located on the LAN. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, and um, uh, Wikipedia has a pretty good uh, article on this if you'd like to look at it in a little bit more depth. Uh, it has several more examples you can take a look. Uh, but otherwise, this is the, basically the idea of, of how we get from a local area network to the Internet uh, and uh, how we separate that kind of traffic. So let's move on. Um, uh, because it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, and I want to mention this, um, uh, 
things have changed a bit since IP addressing was first conceived. Um, and when there were when there were only a few networks, um, we could afford to waste a lot of IP addresses. Uh, when um, the early '80s, when TCP uh, IP and uh, IP version four were adopted for general use on the internet, uh, this uh, so-called classful uh, networking approach worked well. Uh, but the problem is, is that we, we quickly started to run out of uh, IP addresses. So uh, we had to come up, uh, we, had, we had to come up with ways of, of what we call subnetting to, to accommodate this. Um, and so this, the so-called classful, the class A, B, and C uh, has been replaced by what we call CIDR uh, or classless interdomain routing. Uh, you still see references to class A, B, and C, but we don't use that anymore. So, I mean, if you were to consider a small network, say you had a company that you needed uh, 2,500 devices uh, or nodes, um, a class B network would waste almost 64,000 addresses, and a class A uh, would, wouldn't, wouldn't have nearly enough. So, uh, CIDR makes the AP addresses much more granular, so fewer addresses are wasted. Uh, and it does this by drawing the boundary between host and network at other than the traditional octet locations. Um, so for example, a class B address might be represented um, this way, um, where we have, here's all the network uh, portion of the address, and here's all the host portion of the address. Well, we don't, we don't have to draw the line right here at the dot. We can draw the line, as you see over here, um, halfway through this octet. Uh, and so uh, here, if, if we draw the line here, uh, this is what we call a slash 20 network, um, uh, where we've got um, uh, 20, um, uh, we've got um, 20 bits used to identify uh, the network host. And this actually will provide us with a network uh, of um, uh, 4,094 uh, hosts. And, and so this is, this is what you'll see now. Uh, and so it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, if you happen to be reading the literature, this is this is what we have going on uh, today. And so you'll see a subnet mask, for example, for a slash 20 network that would be 255, 255, 240, and 0. So um, let's continue. So um, now let's talk about um, uh, naming uh, and how we resolve names uh, on the internet uh, using internet protocol um, and, and let's first talk about uh, IP addresses they can either be static which means permanently assigned and relatively under unchanging um, or dynamic uh, which is assigned only when needed on demand um, so servers um, so web servers for example a good example um, like Google or, or uh, Yahoo um, are, are usually assigned static addresses. That means the the IP address doesn't change, uh, and that's because clients need to be able to find them. If if Google's address was constantly changing, you'd never find it. Um, client computers, on the other hand, such as your PC, um, can change all the time because your PC doesn't really need to be discoverable when when you go to uh, a website such as Google and say, I want to know this piece of information, send me this piece of information. Um, you provide your current IP address as part of the, re as part of the request, so um, Google knows where to send back the answer. Um, so there's a protocol um, that your, your ISP runs uh, to give you an IP address when you need one called um, DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. But um, for the, the Googles of the world who run web servers, um, they need something to match up their name, Google, um, with their IP address, which um, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. It's one of those numbers, and that's the reason we need a name uh, to match their number. Uh, so the service that matches the name to the number is called Domain Name System. Um, and the Domain Name System uh, keeps track of which host names belong to which uh, IP addresses. 
so this is just the phone system analogy, and, and it's the phone book um, that keeps track of the phone numbers. Um, and, and we can actually torture this a little bit farther because the domain name system is actually a hierarchy um, uh, that starts with um, a, a series of root servers. So um, we'll, we'll torture this analogy a little bit. So phone directories can exist at the individual and um, organizational level. So if you're on the U of A campus and you want to make a call to a U of A employee or department, uh, you might check your own file first. So maybe you've got a contact list or back in the olden days we would have a Rolodex. I, I guess nobody uses Rolodex anymore, maybe. Uh, and if it's not there, uh, maybe there's a printed uh, University of Arizona directory. Uh, those numbers might not be collected in any place else, and that directory has numbers that don't appear in the city of Tucson directory. I guess nobody uses those anymore, huh? Uh, anyway, uh, if it's not in either of those places, then you go to a local or regional directory. Um, perhaps it's not in the U of A network. Uh, once you have the number, you can look at the prefix, uh, 621 or 626, and see if that might be a U of A phone number. Uh, sort of like the subnet mass drops out local and remote portions of IP addresses. Uh, and then in the same vein, if you have a small cache of IP addresses and names you can maintain locally, um, there's on your computer what's called a hosts file. That's a bit like a Rolodex of unlisted numbers. Um, so uh, now we go to the um, computer side. Uh, there actually is on your computer what's called a hosts file. Uh, that acts kind of like a Rolodex, um, uh, which can be a list of unnamed, um, uh, 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 unlisted, um, unlisted numbers. Um, then the U of A maintains a DNS server, its own DNS server, uh, that keeps track of host names and IP addresses within the U of A domain. And then upstream DNS servers at your ISP maintain regional information. And then there's a whole chain of DNS servers with multiple redundancies. So much like there is a whole chain or sequence of phone directories that you can use to look up telephone numbers, there's a whole sequence or hierarchy of DNS servers, uh, starting with a local DNS cache on your own computer, going to one at your ISP, going to one at your regional, um, one at your regional ones. Um, so... Um, all you really need to find is the network portion of the IP address once that is located. Um, it, it, it goes up to the next DNS server up the chain. Uh, and um, uh, from there, there's a whole sequence of, of DNS servers that are used to uh, figure out where that message needs to go. Uh, and um, uh, that's how that process works. Uh, and IP addresses are always undergoing a process of synchronization. So, uh, for example, if, if you run a web server uh, and um, you host your website at mywebsite.com and you get assigned a new IP address, uh, it can take anywhere from minutes or hours to propagate through DNS so that anywhere in the world will find your new IP address when they look for it. Uh, and so the end of the DNS line uh, is, is one of the Internet's uh, 13 uh, what are called root name servers. Um, actually, there's more than 13 because there's some redundancy and, and um, backup servers and so on, but there's, there's logically there, there are 13 of them. Uh, and each one of them is um, charged with managing a chain uh, linking one of the top-level domains. Uh, so there's com, edu, and so on. Uh, and actually, the, the, um, these are the target of some serious hacking attacks. So there, there's a couple stories, a few Google stories about it. The Internet has almost uh, been brought to a crash a few different times by hacker attacks. Um, anyway, um, a, global inter a global oversight for Internet names and IP addresses is the responsibility of IANA, which is the... Uh, Internet Assigned uh, Numbers Authority, and they maintain a list of the generic top-level domains uh, and the individual uh, organizations responsible for their registries. Um, outside the United States, ISO country codes are used as part of the DNS naming conventions. Uh, 
uh, and these are referred to as CCTLDS. There is a Who is Lookup service maintained by um, uh, registry organizations that allows you to find out registration information for specific assigned names. Uh, Educause, uh, for example, maintains a Who is database for the .edu top level domains, so you can find out uh, for any .edu, who, who is the registrant, um, what their information is. Uh, so you can go to that website uh, shown on the slide here uh, and try those. Um, and um, so a fully qualified domain name is the human readable counterpart to the network host IP address combo. Uh, so suppose you have a server that has the um, host name of Jupyter uh, on a mydomain.com name, then the, then the fully qualified domain name would be jupiter.mydomain.com. Uh, and if there was a named subnetwork, say accounting, the fully qualified domain name might be jupiter.accounting.mydomain.com. So um, let, me, let me back up a minute and, and tell you why I... I brought up the Microsoft issue about the naming and the cats thing and that whole subject because um, you might also have named that Microsoft name Saturn and so then you would have a share named Saturn slash accounting um, now hopefully you would you would do your internet name and your Microsoft name the same but you wouldn't necessarily have to. And that, that's why even sysadmins tear their hair out sometimes because these things can get complicated in practice. But anyway, so fully qual qualified domain name um, is this, um, is this um, uh, um, uh, name that, that goes through the domain name system and is qualified by the um, uh, computer name plus the, the IP. Uh, address name uh, and um, so anyway let me continue um, so that's name re resolution beyond the LAN um, so applications on your computer use uh, DNS and the IP protocol to find the IP address corresponding to a domain name uh, then they strip off the network and host portions. If the network is not uh, the LAN, the package gets offloaded to a router that sends it on its way. Uh, and then it's up to the recipient's router to figure out how to get it to the local machine, uh, which brings us back to the MAC address. Um, so remember that the LAN is built on um, a protocol like Ethernet. Um, Ethernet traffic relies on the MAC address for communication. So how is the IP hostname resolved to a MAC address? Uh, well, uh, through another protocol, of course. This time it's ARP, which stands for Address Resolution Protocol. Uh, ARP sets up a system whereby each device on the LAN maintains an, a cache of IP addresses and MAC addresses. So uh, if it's missing one, it sends a shout down the line for someone to respond. I'm looking for IP address such and such. If you've been given an IP address such and such, then holler back with your MAC address so I can update my ARP cache. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how all this uh, works together. So we've talked about the IP part of TCP IP, uh, and now we need to cover the TCP part. Uh, the TCP part of TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, and is one of two um, uh, protocols that manage the reliability of data exchanged over the internet. Um, the other is UDP, which stands for User Datagram Protocol, uh, TCP's lazy younger brother. Most internet traffic needs to be reliable, so the stack is commonly referred to as TCP IP, but UDP is increasingly important. Um, TCP is a connection-oriented protocol that's charged with making sure all packets in a transmission arrive intact and in the proper order. Um, it involves a series of handshaking steps. Handshaking means that the sender and receiver first confirm that they're communicating uh, and are prepared to exchange information and the data is exchanged. 
the validity if the data is confirmed. And it's important that the data is sent and received in the proper order. So uh, TCP needs to manage a fair amount of traffic. Uh, and as you can imagine, this involves a lot of communication between the sender and the receiver. Most of it's short and packet-based. Uh, so there's no persistent connection between the sender and the receiver. Uh, but nevertheless, there is overhead. So uh, if you were sending, for example, a spreadsheet, um, you would want to make sure that all the data is there, that the data is exactly sent as it was received, uh, and um, uh, you'd want to make sure that it was received uh, complete and, and intact. Um, now, UDP um, uh, is, is, is un Un unreliable. It, it stands for um, um, uh, user datagram protocol, but but I like to think of it as kind of unreliable datagram protocol. And and um, because there's no validity checking or even checking about whether packets arrive, so you think, well, what good is that? But if you think about it, um, it's used for for data such as video or audio streams and. Um, for video or audio, um, it's okay if, if there are a few missing or out-of-order bits because it doesn't really affect the overall quality of the transmission. Uh, and so where it's warranted, it's very efficient, consumes fewer resources on both the sending and uh, receiving end. You take some information, you wrap it up, send it on its way, uh, and so we're done. So um, I, th I think that's probably enough for this lecture. We're about 45 minutes, and that's about twice as long as I, I like my lectures to be. But we've covered a lot of material, uh, and I know that some of this is pretty dense. Um, some of it we're, we're um, uh, kind of scratching the surface on, uh, and um, uh, some of it um, uh, I wish we could go into even more detail, but we're, we're probably um, uh, reaching the limit. So... Um, I, I hope you understand more than you did before, and in the case about the individual services um, formats and, and processes, uh, what we call protocols, uh, and um, uh, that, that it's a good supplement and that uh, uh, maybe when you read the text and some of the, look at some of the other resources that uh, you have a little bit better understanding. So thank you very much for watching, uh, and um, I look forward to uh, uh, looking at your discussions and uh, uh, reading your assignments uh, in the Dropbox. Thank you for watching.